Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Tim. I'm the minister here. Um, as uh, Carolyn has just said, we're doing a, a five-week series looking at uh, the Bible as a five-act play. Uh, this is work done by one of my theological heroes, uh, a guy called Tom Wright, and he, uh, he decided he was going to try and get everybody to move away from the idea of using the Bible like a kind of, uh, like a slot machine, like a kind of, I need to find the right answer and the right verse to fit me. And so he came up with this idea that uh, you can see the Bible as a whole uh, uh, five act, well, he said six act, but we've only got five weeks and I don't like his last act. So we're going to ignore that one and fit the five acts in. And uh, he had uh, the first uh, act of the play is creation, um, the second act, the fall, the third act, Israel, the fourth act, Jesus, and the final act we're looking at next week is the church. He did this to try and get people to, and the reason why we're doing it, is to get uh, to understand uh, the story, to be able to tell the story, and to individually and corporately to live the story. So suddenly the Bible moves from being this kind of slot machine to actually living out in all our lives as a church and as individuals. It is a bit of a soapbox of mine, uh, this whole idea of reading the Bible as a whole, is seeing it from Genesis 1 all the way through to the end of Revelation, rather than just picking one thing and taking it totally out of context. We might be revisiting that in a bit, uh, but it is a soapbox of mine that I, tr I babble on incessantly about. Uh, we looked at this idea of Salem and Demut in creation. Um, this is uh, from Genesis 1. Uh, Hebrew words are found in Genesis 1.26, this idea that we're created in the image and likeness of God, Salem and Demut. That means we are his representative on earth, that before the fall, we were created holy. Before the fall, we were God's idol. Not that he worships us, but we represent him. We stand in creation as his representative. And then we have... Um, we uh, looked a little bit at Ephesians 2, this idea that the start of Ephesians 2 talks about you, you were dead to sin. But wait a minute, Ephesians 2, there's got to be in Ephesians 1. In Ephesians 1, it talks about us being created before creation, holy in his presence. Uh, then we talked about the fall, the idea that, yes, it's not that I don't believe in sin, but let's look at it in the order that it came in the Bible. Sin did happen, but it came in Genesis 2 uh, and ge not in Genesis 1. The fall, that all of the, the, the idea that all of us has sin in our lives, it goes beyond just the personal. It it's, it's becomes a community, it's part of our country, and it's part of the world that sin is, it pervades all areas. And then last week we looked at Israel as the, the, the third act. Israel and covenant. This idea that, that God, its definition of covenant, that God uh, will be to you as he should be. Whether or not you are as you should be to him. Let's just read that again. That actually, this is God speaking. I will be to you as I should be whether or not you are as you should be to me. And this narrative goes all the way through, uh, from Genesis all the way through to the end of Malachi, this journey of Israel chosen by God to be a blessing to the world, but continually dropping the ball, continually falling short in their covenant or relationship with God. And so we come to today. We come to today where we're looking at Jesus and the thing is, what I want to do is start by looking at different types of Jesus. That yes, it is part of him, but actually it's, it's something that we can't just keep our eyes on. Uh, in the same way we can't take a verse out of context, we can't just look at this idea that Jesus is political, full stop. And I, I found a great picture. My God is a Republican. Um, <laughs> which <laughs> is terrifying thought. And... Um, uh, especially this week with, with, with the visits uh, to our shores. And, uh, but this idea that, that uh, a lot of us, a lot of people read the Bible and read the stories of Jesus and go, look at him, he's a political person. Especially we think there's this thing called liberation theology that happened in, in Central America, which in itself isn't wrong, but they took an aspect of the story of Jesus, this idea that you can be freed from, your, from, from sin and slavery and have that perfect relationship with God. They took that idea of freedom and applied it to people's physical lives. Now, that in on itself isn't wrong. 
And there's these ver- various uh, theologians at the time uh, where this was developed who were working in horrible, oppressive situations. And they were talking about the liberation that, uh, that, that Jesus could bring. But it was kind of, that was the only thing they'd talk about. It was like single-issue churches. There's quite a few of them around that only talk about one aspect of, of the story of Jesus or one aspect of the story of the Bible, whether that be liberation or whether that be, be sexuality. And they just talk about the issue rather than the person that brought it up, Jesus. Jesus was political. When he taught, he, some of the things he said were overtly political. But at the same time, there were other things he talked about as well. If you carry it on into Paul's letters, um, the, the statement, Jesus is Lord, it came, comes through in John's Gospel three or four times, but actually it becomes quite prevalent in Paul's letters, is a political statement. It's a political statement because the th- phrase at the time that was prevalent was one that Caesar coined, uh, coined, and the illustration is they found coins with it written on. And on these coins, it said, Caesar Augustus Tiberius, son of, di- of the divine Augustus. And this was written on all the coins. The idea that actually uh, that Caesar and his father were both divine, they were Lord. And the expression of that was a saying that they made people say, Caesar is Lord. And that was before the phrase, Jesus is Lord. Can you imagine the countercultural um, expression of that in that context? It was profoundly political. Not Caesar, Jesus is Lord. And we can sometimes get so bogged down with the, 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 the Jesus story as being this political one that we miss other aspects of who he was and what he said. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying, and don't, I don't want people going away thinking I said this, that we shouldn't be political, because I think we should. Even more so next weekend, there's been an ongoing discussion in, in our family and on Facebook a little bit about whether we should be protesting against Trump's visit. I personally think we should be. And what the discussion on our table was, was the, the inflatable uh, blimp, the baby uh, thing that they raise money for that they're going to float over London. Is this a good thing to be done or is this not a good thing to be done? The interesting thing is, I don't think it's... It's funny for like a second. It's like, (laughs) but actually, it's not that funny. But should it be done? I think actually we're called to to, to dissent and to raise issues like that and go, I think it's wrong that we have somebody whose hands on literally on the button of nuclear war and he's saying things and acting like he is. Crumbs, my dad's the same age as him. We don't give him the controls to the telly. (laughs) And he's got the butt finger on the button. Should we protest at these things? As Christians, should we be praying that that, 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 that actually Donald Trump finds God in this? Yes, we should. Is that the cornerstone of our gospel that we preach? No. Second thing. Life coach Jesus. (laughs) You're all thinking, what's the picture going to be? (laughs) Buddy Jesus. (laughs) Okay. Now, the thing is, there are some really important lessons that we can learn from Jesus that would help anyone if they took them on board. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, love your neighbor. Love someone who lives next door. That's a good thing. It'd be less stressful. Forgive someone their sins. Forgive somebody who's done something to you. You'd be less stressed. That is a good thing. It is a good life coaching thing to look at. But is that the only bit and the only thing that Jesus said? He also said them things that actually are not really kind of top of the list of life coaches. Matthew 5, 48. You must be perfect. Not a great opening gambit. I've never been to a life coaching event, but I'm guessing if you started with that, I don't think you'd get many sign-ups. The idea that this life coach is going to stand at the front and say, well, bottom line is you've got to be perfect. Matthew 19, 21. Sell all you have. Not a great suggestion to, to, 
to kind of lead with your life. Matthew 10, verse 37. You must hate your parents. For some of us, this might be an easy thing. <laughs> some of us, it won't be. But that's what Jesus said. So we have political Jesus. If we come, and that is the only way we read about Jesus and the only glasses we read about Jesus, we're not getting the full picture. If it's life coach Jesus, if we're finding new ways of just living and finding a new way of acting, life coach Jesus. He does some great things to live your life by. But when it comes down to it, really, is that all that Jesus came to say and to do? Feel good, Jesus. Now, the thing is, I was going to call this touchy-feely Jesus, but that, that kind of really, oh dear, no, we're not going to call it that. Uh, so we came up with feel good, Jesus, and we get a little huggy Jesus. Look at that. There's a few of you are thinking, I would buy that. Um, otherwise known as hipster Jesus or uh, hair conditioner, where is it, Jesus? <laughs> um, but feel good, Jesus. The interesting thing is, if you, if you look at the gospel stories, something to, to, you know, there are events where people went away happy and feeling like they've met Jesus and went away, oh, look, I'm not a leper anymore. And they're like, ooh, yeah, great. And the stories we can read, the, the parable of the ten lepers, Luke 17, where nine of them were just ran off, ooh, yeah, great. But one came back full of joy and thanking God, which is great. And we can feel good about meeting Jesus. In a few weeks, there's quite a lot of us about to go off to new wine. In a field in... in, in is it Somerset? It is Somerset, isn't it? Yeah. In a field in Somerset it, with uh, amazing kind of four or 5,000 people, an amazing band playing, and we can go and we can feel really good about Jesus. And we can feel really good about being a Christian. But is that really what he came to do when he died on the cross, did he really kind of get us to the point where we'll just feel good about ourselves? Really? Because 1 Corinthians 3, and it talks about moving on from milk onto solids. This idea that it, we need to move beyond the warm fuzzy. We need to move beyond the, oh, it makes me feel good about myself. To going away from meetings and going, oh, that was really good. To come away from here and just, oh, that was really good. Jesus is more than that. It's interesting, um, um, Lois, who, who came and did the talks a few weeks ago, she uh, bought me a book as a thank you, and uh, I've been reading it. Fantastic book. And um, it talks a lot about the, the um, education system in, in, in Jewish context, in ancient Near East. And it talks a lot um, about education and worship. And that actually that there's a false split in those two in our society, in the very Greek way of looking at things. And that actually, from their perspective, education and worship were totally interchangeable. It's just as important to learn about, the, about, about God through the written scriptures as it is to learn about God through sung worship. It's a false dichotomy when we put this idea that, wait a minute, we're going to read our Bible, and then we feel good about ourselves in the worship. And actually reading the Bible is just as much as an act of worship as the singing is. Let's start splitting it up. Let's move on from the feel-good Jesus. Let's leave behind this idea of a political Jesus, and that's all we know about him. Let's leave behind this idea of, 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 of the kind of life coach Jesus and try and embrace the reality of who he truly was and what he said in our lives. If you've got your Bible to hand, we're just going to kind of bring it into land with uh, Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed with the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
be trans- do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I've spoken about this before here, but the idea that actually I think God calls us to be Spider-Man, not Batman. And this verse from Scriptures sums that up brilliantly. Bear with me. If you're confused by Batman or Spider-Man, ask any child under the age of eight and they will know the difference. Batman is someone who is a billionaire. He's got a, a, a bat mask and a bat belt and he's a billionaire and he fights justice on the streets of Gotham, and whatever situation he, he is in, he will have something relevant to help him. Whether it's shark repellent spray or a batarang or, or, or something to fire out and to, to mend bridges, his belt will help him. He fights justice with this belt. The interesting thing is Spider-Man is completely different. He is someone who's a teenager who was bitten by a radioactive spider. Don't panic, it's his only a story. And he gets bitten by a radioactive spider, and the stuff that's injected into his body rewires him as a human being. And when he's in a situation where he needs help, he is, by who he's becoming, relevant to that situation. Whether he needs to climb a wall, fire a thing out of his wrist or spider sense or whatever it is, by what he becomes, he is relevant to the situation. The thing is, we can look at political Jesus, life coach Jesus, and look at all these different ways of looking at Jesus, but when it comes down to it, all they are is Batman spirituality. It's just grabbing at something, hoping it will help. But when it comes down to it, God calls us to be transformed, just like Spider-Man. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good and pleasing and perfect will. It's Batman and Spider-Man. But the interesting thing is, what is the fruit of Spider-Man? What is it when we take it seriously? What is it when we move beyond the the life coach, beyond the political, beyond the, the single issue, Jesus, and embrace it for who it is? What will happen What I want to say is that actually we will have questions of our faith. The interesting thing is like like me and you, whether you're at work, whether you're in your church, whether in your street, whether in your house, who we are should beg questions of our faith. If people aren't asking questions of our faith, don't don't ask questions of them. Ask questions of yourself of why not. If we're living that Spider-Man spirituality, we will have questions of faith. Secondly, we will have conflict in faith. We shouldn't be scared of that idea that our faith will bring about conflict. Now, I'm not saying it will be a fight, but in some cases it is. We've heard bits of situation that are going on in, 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 in the Middle East at the minute that has just been shared earlier, that there are conflicts in faith. When we take Jesus fully for who he is, we know this will happen. The fruit of this life. There will be questions of our faith. There will be conflicts in our faith. And actually, we will build people of faith. Yes, our faith will grow in ourselves, but people of our faith will grow as well. People who weren't interested in Jesus will become interested in Jesus. The net result, the fruit is, in the next two weeks, we have six people who will be baptized of all ages and all journeys. Some of them, it was a kind of, oh, crumbs, I've not been baptized, I'll do it. Uh, and, and others, it's just a, a recognition that, yes, this is me. And for others, it's a, actually, I'm revisiting something that I had as a child that I've lost. When we get it right, when we embrace Jesus for fully who he is, there will be questions of faith. There'll be conflict, but there will be people growing of faith. Let's bow our heads.